I'm Anastasia. I'm a staff scientist over at the Visa Institute at Harvard. And today I'll talk to you about a field that probably a lot of you haven't really heard about, of like bio nanotechnology, and how we're using that to like build molecules that can interact with the body in new ways to come up with therapeutics and diagnostics for things we don't currently have good solutions for. So I thought I would give you a bit of an overview of the field, a little bit about what I've been working on specifically, and then hopefully open it up to just a more interactive discussion about potential applications towards longevity and other fields, and just hear what uh, your thoughts are. And so to hijack a little bit on the theme that Allison brought up in the opening evening of positive futures inspired by sci-fi, I'm guessing a lot of you have watched Doctor Who and maybe remember like the nanobots, nanogenes that featured in one of the earlier seasons of the reboot, which are these like nanoscale devices essentially that can go around and use blueprints of what they think a healthy body is and fix disease states just by rapidly healing wounds and figuring out what's wrong and just copying the blueprint that they know. And it's super important that we know what a healthy state looks like. You might remember from that episode what goes wrong if you don't. And that's something that there have been lots of advances in things like spatial biology in recent years. Uh, you've heard a little bit about um, expansion microscopy potentially on Monday from the FROs. You'll hear more about it tomorrow with Ed Boyden's talk. And also just like super resolution imaging technologies. And I just wanted to highlight this one paper from uh, Ralph Jungmann's lab, which I thought was absolutely awesome, where um, they took brain tissue and did single protein resolution imaging. So like literally you can pinpoint individual proteins in the brain. And using that, and like coupled with some AI segmentation techniques, they were able to identify like the molecular patterns that correspond to different types of synapses. And in addition to like the standard excitatory and inhibitory synapses we know about, they're like, oh, actually, there's this other type with this other blueprint that they've been calling mixed synapses, because the proteins expressed there correspond to both excitatory ones, inhibitory ones, and some other things. And so there's like totally new biology we've never known about that's being uncovered by these like spatial blueprinting approaches. And so the question that I'm asking is how do we exploit these insights of like the positioning of different proteins to make more potent therapeutics? with uh, potentially fewer side effects to maybe address diseases that we currently don't have good solutions for, such as neurodegenerative diseases, immunological dysregulation, cancer, and so on, where a lot of the treatments now are very crude, mostly just based on uh, symptoms and not really the underlying dysregulation. And the field I'll talk to you today about is called DNA nanotechnology. So, I want you to forget everything you know about genetics for a moment, and sort of the way we make furniture out of trees, completely ignoring the biology of trees, we're using DNA as a material for building stuff on the nanoscale. And the thing that enables us to do that is the fact that DNA is uh, pretty predictable in its structure and also really stable. We know it forms a double helix with uh, very specific geometry, so like two nanometers in width, 3.4 nanometers per turn, and we know also, like, if we have a sequence of, like, A's, T's, C's, and G's, the nucleotides that make up the DNA, A will usually pair with T on a different strand, C with G. And so we can program those sequences um, in different regions of different DNA strands and force them to interact with each other in certain ways. And probably the most famous example of how to do that, and maybe the first, one, one of the earlier proof of principles, is this approach called DNA origami where you have this one really long strand of DNA, which is shown in gray in this animation, and many uh, called the scaffold strand, and many shorter strands, called staple strands, the colorful ones here, that are designed to specifically bind to different parts of that scaffold strand and force it to fold in a certain shape, kind of like a DNA origami, uh, sort of like a regular origami, just purely out of DNA. And so in this case, you can see this uh, rectangle shape emerging. And typically for the scaffold strand, people use uh, the genome of a virus that's like single-stranded already. It's a few thousand uh, nucleotides in length, and that enables us to fold structures maybe around 100 nanometers in size. And the very first paper doing this was from Paul Rothman in 2006. And this is probably the most famous example, like he made a little smiley face. But he had other cool things in the paper too, like maps of the world and like crazy things like that. And since then, people have expanded this to make uh, like 3D structures, like different mechanical devices, like hinges, and lots of, lots of new behaviors. And the thing I've personally found most exciting about is the application of this to therapeutics and using this technology to position guest molecules like proteins and stuff. So the idea here is that you take a DNA origami and then you can like attach 
molecules like proteins in, in specific locations on there. So in like the sub 100 nanometer space, uh, resolution, so like you have a 100 nanometer sized like canvas essentially, and with like a few nanometer resolution, you can specifically position proteins of interest. And there have been lots of new applications in uh, therapeutics, mostly driven by the concept of uh, positioning different ligands and proteins at defined spacing. Some of these are focused on sort of mimicking the natural distribution of ligands and receptors. So, for example, for insulin signaling, it's been found that insulin receptors are normally arranged in clusters. So if you present insulin instead of just like a single insulin molecule on its own, but instead match with the geometry of those clusters, you can get away with a much lower dose uh, for activation of insulin signaling, which is in itself kind of interesting. Insulin is uh, quite cheap at this point, just because of economy of scale, it's been around for a while. But there are potential uh, applications that in terms of fewer side effects, fewer injections and delivery, things like that. Then uh, one thing that's been quite exciting is uh, for uh, immune activation. So uh, in this paper from Mark Batis' lab, they mimicked the way HIV immunogens are present on like the actual viral particles, and they showed that you can find, get much stronger B cell activation than you would just purely by having those immunogens on their own. And likewise, for things like epidermal growth factor receptor activation, which is pretty important for uh, development for cancer and so on. Then you can go a little crazier, and instead of just positioning one protein at a time, you can position multiple together and get a more fine-tuned modulation of activation pathways, potentially longer activation, which means fewer doses needed, fewer off-target side effects. And for things like cancer vaccination, you can position the adjuvants that increase your immune system signaling with the antigen, the thing you're trying to vaccinate against, on a single particle at its precise spacing, and what that enables you to do is get away, on the one hand, with fewer doses of that and get fewer side effects of like just activating the immune system in general because now the immune cells that you are activating are responding to the antigen that's in close proximity to them. But also, by doing the right spacing uh, as like, the way the receptors are, you're enabling lower doses. So you can do vaccination with far fewer off-target effects, which can be really important in like uh, cancer populations. Then we can also focus on biology that just doesn't exist naturally. For example, the notch pathway, it's really important for developmental biology. And typically the way the pathway is activated is by having a force signal. And what uh, this uh, paper from Bjorn Hol Holberg's lab found is that just by patterning like this JAG1 protein on DNA origami, you can suddenly get away without, ha like, without having that um, force signal and still get notch activation, which is really interesting because uh, potentially there are other pathways in biology where instead of just targeting the traditional uh, activation pathways and the way the biology works naturally, maybe we can hijack some of these concepts and get, essentially invent new biology as a therapeutic modality. And then you can also engineer more complex behaviors. So sort of along the lines of what I was showing you previously with uh, patterning that corresponds to the way receptors are organized in biology. Uh, in this paper, they did exactly that with a CD95 for arthritis. So they found that the proteins are naturally forming the, this hexagon arrangement. So now they're putting the ligands in that same hexagon arrangement on DNA origami uh, so to get strong activation. But then more interestingly, to get more targeted drug delivery, they're now attaching these little fastener strands to roll up the DNA origami, so like these ligands are not normally accessible, and these fasteners are responsive to pH. So in inflamed tissue, uh, you have lower pH, and so this origami will open up, and now will be hyperactive wherever you have like, um, inflammation and arthritis. So targeted drug delivery and hyperactivation. And people have done the same concept with uh, lots of other types of signals, so for example, like aptamers against, for targeted drug delivery, where you have like a box that opens up when uh, that uh, aptamer ant antibody binds to a specific target and then releases the drug. Um, so you can engineer lots of interesting behaviors like that and get like AND gates and like look for uh, localization of different signals. So this is all great. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this stuff is all on the 100 nanometer scale. However, you think about biology and cells and stuff, 
things are typically a lot bigger. So cells are multiple microns in size, and a lot of like the a complex biology that happens that single molecules cannot address happens across those size scales, so in the micron scale. So things like synapses, both immune synapses, uh, synapses in the brain, and just lots of other cell-cell signaling. And what I will talk to you about next is some of the work we've done to address, to expand that DNA origami technology and those approaches into the micron scale and make it a lot more robust. And the problem with conventional DNA origami is, is that you're using this one long strand of DNA to organize everything, and there are limits to how big you can make that. Um, because the, if you make the strand too long, suddenly it starts shearing, and you get like, a lot of things just degrading, aggregating, and it just becomes really problematic. So what if we put multiple DNA origami together? So the way you can sort of think about that is if one puzzle piece is a single DNA origami. If you want to make an array that's like kind of small, like three by three, as I'm showing you over here, you, you can sort of imagine that the problem is like having different puzzle pieces that bind to each other in more or less a specific way, but like not complete, like they can form, the, the optimal way is the puzzle, but you can imagine a lot of off-targets where puzzles just kind of aggregate, come together, and then you put them all in a bag and you shake it, literally just at the right strength uh, that you want, which is equivalent to optimizing the temperature buffer conditions for experimental systems and the concentration of the puzzle pieces. You can picture that for a three by three little thing, you might be able to find the right conditions where most of the puzzle pieces uh, form the complete puzzle. And there is very elegant work out of Greg, uh, by Greg Tichomir, uh, Philip Peterson of Wu Chen's lab, uh, where they did exactly that. They designed the edges of a DNA origami to preferentially bind to other origami in a defined way. And they were able to make these eight by eight arrangements to make the world's smallest Mona Lisa shown over here, which was an absolutely gorgeous tour de force in terms of experimental optimization. But as you can sort of see in this plot over here, if you go from a two by two, grid of origami to four by four to eight by eight, your yield drops off precipitously. And for the sort of therapeutic applications I was mentioning, instead of just an eight by eight uh, puzzle, you'd really want something more the size of this. And like that sort of approach of just fine tuning individual origami becomes really untenable and unscalable, especially if you want to use this for applications where you need lots and lots of material. So I'll talk to you about a method we've been developing, uh, we call crisscross to actually be able to make these far larger structures more reliably with higher yield. And before I jump into that, I would like to just acknowledge the really awesome team I've had the privilege of working with, so particularly Dio, Chris, and Jia, who uh, have been great colleagues uh, pushing this work forward. And of course, uh, William, who uh, is uh, a professor at Harvard and is behind all of this work. So. Um, we're taking the same DNA origami principle as I've been showing you. Instead of making rectangles, we're, now we're making these really long rods, which are where you can imagine that scaffold strands just sort of rooting back and forth throughout these uh, six double helices. And then the little staple strands that force the scaffold to fold into that arrangement now have these little single-stranded DNA protrusions sticking out, so uh, these things here. And we'll have those all along the length of this rod, that, and we call this DNA origami a slot, and you'll see why in a moment. And we designed lots of these slots where they're kind of identical in their core, but those little single-stranded extensions are different. And we'll have 32 of those uh, along the length of each slot, and we designed them to bind uh, to other slots just at one of those locations, just by DNA complementarity, so like the whole A pairs with C, uh, T, C with G. And each one of those is like about seven nucleotides in length, so it's really short and really transient interactions on their own. So what happens is like normally, like those are floating around, they can only form weak interactions with each other, but once we add a little seed, which is a different DNA origami that can bind to a lot of locations on one of those slats, it reorganizes them in a certain way to, in this case, force them all to fold into this square structure over here. That's like 32 by 32 uh, DNA origami. And that's enabled us to make things that are way larger than has been previously possible. So for context, that little yellow square at the end of that timeline uh, is, uh, is the biggest DNA origami we can make like the, out of a single scaffold. And we've been able to make things that are like order of magnitude bigger 
So by positioning over a thousand entirely unique DNA origami slats into one structure, and we've been able to approach yields of around 90% uh, with this. And so we've made like these like heart shapes, ghost shapes, cam shapes, and it's like totally ar arbitrary what we can make. So uh, like any shape you want, we can probably figure out how to make it just by mixing and matching those strands. And for context, the, this thing's about two microns in size, which is basically the size of a bacterial cell. And here's one for scale. And we've uh, been developing more automation right now to push this even further and make things even bigger with even higher yields. And the cool thing about this is that, in this case, every single little line is one of those DNA origami. And on each one of those DNA origami, you can position another molecule, like a protein, an optically active particle, and so on, with basically a few nanometer resolution. So this canvas here allows you to like have like thousands of pixels of addressability where you can position different molecules. And just to have a proof of concept, we just made like puzzle pieces, smiley faces, uh, institutional logos. In this case, using these little DNA uh, structures um, to just get the imaging um, by election microscopy. But in principle, like uh, all these patterns could have been made out of like different proteins and like things that are of biological relevance. So um, for those of you interested in why we're able to do this, um, I'll talk a little bit about the physics for a few minutes. If you're not, feel free to zone out for a little bit. Um, but yeah, so what enables us to just scale this origami technology to build things a lot bigger? And the idea here is that each one of those slats has a certain number of weak bind, uh, bonds it can make. So, and we're running these uh, assemblies at conditions where we require n so of those bonds uh, for stable attachment. So in this design, I'm showing you uh, slats with 16 total binding sites, and eight of those are needed for stable attachment. And in particular, like the interactions are like slats bind either in the horizontal arrangement, we call them X slats, or in the vertical, we call them Y slats. And the number of binding sites here available in the vertical, there are only seven, in the horizontal, there are eight. So if a Y slat tries to bind, it can only form seven bonds and it falls off, because uh, that's not enough, because we need eight for stable attachment. However, an X slat tries to bind horizontally, it can form eight bonds, that is stable, and through that, it adds another vertical bond, so suddenly there are eight now in this direction, and another slat can bind, and the growth can continue in this way. Um, and this is really rapid, because uh, this is energetically very favorable right now. However, the key thing here is we want to prevent this happening spontaneously. So if we have uh, spontaneous, undesired interactions between slats, that would just cause a lot of aggregation and we won't get any of our desired structures. And that becomes especially problematic if we want to make things a lot bigger and more complicated. And the thing here is because each one of those bonds is individually so weak, to get to the point where every one of those slats is bound by eight bonds, so is stably attached, we have to climb this really large free energy barrier. Uh, because we're paying a penalty for bringing those uh, slats out of free solution and not really giving them like that ener energetic boost to compensate. So we want to randomly bring a lot of uh, slats from free solution to form exactly the right arrangement. And so until this forms, we're climbing this really big energetic barrier. However, once this structure where every slat is bound by eight bonds is formed, um, is formed, now we can uh, grow filaments really rapidly. So we call this the critical nucleus. And we can engineer the system simply by requiring more bonds for stable attachment to theoretically just take the age of the universe until one of these randomly forms. So we can engineer deliberately very, very high robustness to this assembly. However, if we introduce that little seed structure I showed you previously, so in this case using DNA origami as an example, we can make it deliberately form much stronger bonds with the first set of slats to pre-organize them in that exact arrangement. So now the next generation of slats can easily bind and growth can proceed really rapidly as I showed you previously. In the previous slides, I showed you this assembly that, that was out of DNA origami. But one thing we can do is instead of having the slats be individual DNA origami, we can just make them single strands of DNA. So in this case, each binding site is just a half turn of DNA, so five or six base pairs. Uh, 
Um, and just as an aside, in principle, this method can be used to self-assemble any material you want, as long as you can get some sort of specificity in your bonds. But it doesn't even have to be perfect. If you're requiring tons of bonds for attachment, that even if there's a little bit of crosstalk, that's totally fine. So you can be a little bit sloppy with your design and still get things to work really well. And so in this case, it's the exact same concept uh, where um, I'm showing you a design where we're requiring six bonds for stable attachment. So in the vertical for the next slat to bind, we only have five available. In the horizontal, we have six. So uh, Y slat tries to come in, doesn't form enough bonds, it falls off. And X slat binds with six bonds, it's stable, provides another bond for that Y slat to bind, and the growth can continue. And we've shown that we can grow these like ribbons out of single strands of DNA that grow to many microns in length, so literally the width of a human hair, and pretty rapidly within minutes to hours, uh, which is quite remarkable since we just have a bunch of single-stranded DNA floating around in very high concentrations, and just if we add this like little seed structure, they can like boom, like form these really long ribbons. Um, and the advantage of using single-stranded DNA over DNA origami is because the monomers are a lot smaller we can use much higher concentrations of them. So we can engineer systems that assemble a lot more rapidly. And the thing we've been really excited to do with this is use this as an amplification strategy for biomarker detection, so for diagnostics. And there are a few advantages uh, of doing this. First, by having that robustness to unwanted assembly, we can uh, engineer systems which, with very low false positive rates because you don't have off-target interactions and also uh, low false negative rates, uh, partly because we have uh, pretty good amplification, but then also uh, we have greater robustness to things like mutations, like if there are mismatches, like for example for PCR, if you have a mutation in your primer binding site, uh, your PCR won't work. So we can engineer some robustness through those sorts of things, but also like to sample degradation and presence of enzyme inhibitors because it's completely enzyme-free. It's literally just DNA strands interacting with other DNA strands. And if you might remember from um, COVID times, like a huge problem with like PCR testing labs it was the concept of amplicon generation. So you're directly copying the thing you're trying to detect and exponentially amplifying that. You open that tube, that stuff goes everywhere, and suddenly um, your future reaction runs are all testing positive, even if they're not. In our case, we're growing these big uh, ribbons out of DNA from a single biomarker, and it, there are no covalent bonds formed, so we can just destroy any amplification from previous reaction runs and not worry about that sort of contamination. And it's also intrinsically very low cost and robust since it's just DNA and buffer, like DNA is like pennies per reaction. And we uh, install isothermal, so we can run these reactions at a single temperature, which means that we don't need equipment like thermocyclers and things like that that are necessary for other um, ultra-sensitive diagnostics methods. And the way this works, I'll show you a little stop motion animation where every single pipe cleaner represents a DNA strand. So you can picture a biomarker, so in this case, a nucleic acid. Um, we design these little green strands to uh, bind to specific regions of that and then trigger what we call uh, a nano seed to form, which then leads to the amplification as I showed you previously. Um, and so from the single nucleic acid biomarker, the red strand, we can get these really big long filaments of DNA growing. And the, the idea here is like that now that we have this really big ribbon, we can detect it with low cost methods based on a couple factors. On the one hand, size separation, since it's a lot bigger than the monomers, but then also we're converting single stranded DNA into double stranded DNA. And there are just dyes that bind preferentially to double stranded DNA, so you can just see this happening with your naked eye. Yeah. Uh, so I will get into that in a moment, but you can just use different sequences to form different shapes and structures. Uh, so we can uh, have little extensions going off of one end uh, to force it to like grow into different directions. But then you can also play tricks with like DNA likes to be 10.5 base pairs per turn. So if you use more or less than that, you can actually get it to twist in certain directions. So there's a lot of programmability that you can do uh, to just make whatever shapes you want. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, with this method, we've shown that we can detect uh, viral DNA and RNA um, and uh, do this in an additive fashion, detecting both in a one-pot reaction. 
We've also been able to detect uh, genomic DNA from bacteria like E. coli and get like additive signals there as well. And, but however, like the limitation of the system that I just showed you is that we're just growing like one ribbon per biomarker. So whilst that's happening quite robustly, it makes it kind of hard to get truly ultra sensitive detection. Because like say if you have one copy of your uh, biomarker in a milliliter reaction, even if you grow something that's like the size, like the width of a human hair, that might still be a little bit hard to detect. So one thing we've been really excited to do now is to go from this linear amplification regime to an exponential amplification regime. And the way we do this is using this concept of toehold mediated strand displacement. And uh, if you haven't heard of this uh, before, it's been the basis of a lot of the really cool stuff that has come out of our field, in particular using DNA strands to like execute computations and build up logic gates. So for the computer scientists in the audience, it's been shown that DNA strand displacement can, is uh, Turing complete. So in principle, you can implement any algorithm you want just purely out of DNA strands interacting with other DNA strands. And the way this works is that you have this like double-stranded complex, uh, like the little light blue strand with a dark blue strand. Um, but now the light blue strand has a little bit of a single strand extension on the side. So this thing here. And then this green strand uh, can bind to this single stranded extension as shown over here. And because it can also bind to the rest of the light blue strand, it now outcompetes the dark blue strand because it forms more base pairs than the dark blue strand. So it's energetically favorable for the green strand to be bind, to be bound to the light blue strand instead. So now it just it binds, it outcompetes the dark blue strand, and then you end up with this double stranded complex. And that's like been very established, a very common thing people do in the field. We decided to take it a step further. And instead of having just one single strand as like the, uh, like the light blue strand I showed you before, we now decided to split that little light blue strand into many five or six nucleotide domains, those half turns I showed you previously. But then it's exactly the same thing where that green strand binds, it outcompetes the dark blue strand, releasing that into free solution. Um, and we can also do this that, uh, to displace whole assemblies and nanostructures. So the same thing here. Now we have five of those green strands out competing sections of five of those dark blue strands to go from this uh, nanostructure here to like uh, cutting it into the, these two chunks here. So you're displacing off a whole nanostructure from an existing nanostructure. And the neat thing that allows us to do is now we, if we take those like crisscross ribbons I have been talking about and make these uh, single stranded extensions on the edges, so it's exactly the same ribbon as before, you just now have some single stranded DNA sticking out, that can act as those little toe holds for additional strands that are floating around in solution we call cut slats to bind and displace the structure. So you can see this in this animation here. Uh, the cut slats bind, they outcompete uh, like the regions shown in magenta and cyan to cut the structure into two. And now, each one of those has a growth front that can continue polymerizing the ribbons as I showed you previously. And this cutting behavior only happens for like once you've assembled enough of that ribbon to have those toeholds form. So sort of the way cells grow and divide, grow and divide to exponentially amplify, we're doing the exact same thing with just DNA strands interacting with other DNA strands where you get ribbon growth, then the cut slats bind, they break the structure into two, each one of those can then grow and uh, break, grow and break. And we can see that under electron microscopy where if we don't have any cut slats present, we get very few but longer ribbons, but then boom, once you add cut slats um, for the same reaction, you suddenly get lots and lots of shorter fragments. And so you're essentially ex exponentially amplifying that signal. And we've been able to get uh, orders of magnitude better sensitivity and faster assembly using this method. But then we've also coupled this with uh, even more complex nanostructures where suddenly instead of just growing one ribbon using that same principle, we're growing these branched structures and we can make these large like multi-micron sized really dense particles of just self-assembled DNA in response to single biomarkers. And that's enabled us to go down to detecting around 60 molecules per milliliter. So uh, basically approaching single molecule counting where like one molecule um, of your biomarker can trigger the self-assembly of these massive, massive particles that just completely deplete all the monomers out of free solution. 
And like some things we're working on currently is like making this even faster and more sensitive by combining like that uh, growth incision approach with the hyperbranching approach and then expanding it to like protein detection, not just nucleic acid detection. And hopefully also leveraging some of the computational aspects we could do with like DNA to exploit spatial proximity of different biomarkers to like detect more complex molecular signals. So some of the challenges the field has uh, been facing is that there's a little bit of that chicken and egg problem of like, you can address complex biology, but we don't necessarily know what that biology is. So really figuring out the best applications to go after, especially for like the more interesting things where you can change the way uh, normal pathways work to get new types of phenotypes. But then also just purely on a synthesis perspective, um, being able to get these things like really scalable, robust for larger scale manufacture, um, and also for biocompatibility. So DNA is intrinsically immunogenic, which is perfectly fine for applications where you're making vaccines and things and you wanna activate the immune system, but might be problematic for other applications. And there are also a lot of enzymes in your body that wanna degrade DNA. And like one thing I think is super cool and an elegant solution to that is mirror image DNA, which is just DNA, but a different optical chirality. So the chemical properties and the self-assembly should exa be exactly the same, but suddenly it's completely biocompatible because it's just orthogonal to the way your enzymes work. And that's, this has been explored a, a bit more in the space of aptamers um, and things like that, but still like the uh, economies of scale aren't quite there yet. So DNA right now is really cheap and easy to work with for us, but if we wanted to do this with mirror image DNA, it would be kind of prohibitive. And same thing with other types of nucleic acids like peptide nucleic acids, which might be great for detecting different types of analytes and building different systems. So the more people are interested in working on this sort of stuff, the lower we can bring those costs down. So on that, I'd just like to thank uh, the really awesome team behind this. So particularly William, Dio, Chris, JSL, and Walter. Uh, thank you all for listening. Here's uh, my email if you wanna contact me later. But I'd really just like to open this up for uh, interactive discussion. Uh, like if you guys have any questions or any thoughts about applications to like longevity and other spaces or anything else you'd like to talk about. Thank you.